Hey guys, this is Miss Miller. Um, I think I'm going to start trying to record some of these lectures just so we can get through the material a little bit faster and um, not use, you know, rely on class time and you can watch some of these for homework. But we are getting a little bit behind, so I do feel like this is something necessary to do. Uh, we're going to be focusing our next um, subunit on medieval Islamic art. Um, we've been looking at early Christian art and um, Byzantine art, and both those periods deal with, with Christian themes and Christian iconography and, and sort of the, the development of artists trying to figure out a way to express um, these Christian ideas and beliefs. We're going to switch gears and talk about um, Islamic art during this period. Um, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity are the three of the world's great monotheistic faiths, meaning that they only believe in one God. Um, they share many of the same holy sites, such as Jerusalem, and, and prophets such as Abraham and Jesus Christ. Um, collectively, scholars refer to these religions as the Abrahamic faiths, since Abraham and his family play vital roles in the formation of these religions. So is, you know, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity do share a lot of the same components and a lot of the same history, um, but they just sort of have different beliefs and, and you know, different ideas about um, how some of these religious figures um, sort of played out. Uh, the Islamic faith really focuses on the life of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, it's found, it was, the religion of Islam was founded by Muhammad, um, circa 570 to 632 CE. He was a merchant from the city of Mecca, which is, um, now the modern day city, um, Saudi Arabia. Mecca was a well-established trading city. Um, the Quran, the holy book of Islam, provides very little details about his life. However, there are sayings, um, and these are referred to as hadiths, or hadiths, H-A-D-I-T-H-S, um, which were largely compiled in the centuries following um, his death and provide a, a much larger narrative of the events um, in his life. So, one thing I want to clarify, though, too, when, when you hear the term Islamic art, it's a little bit different than when we talk about early Christian art or Byzantine art, because those are definitely reflecting on specific religious themes. Islamic art isn't necessarily, when you talk about it, isn't really referring just to um, religious um, art and architecture. Um, and and so that's an important distinction to, to, to remember. Um this is the territory um, of the expansion of Islam under um, various rulers, under Muhammad, and then, you know, various expansions um, throughout time. And um, let me go back, though, to this. What is Islamic art? Um, it's important that you understand that Islamic art is a modern concept. Um, it, it's created by art historians. It was um, coined in the 19th century to categorize and, um, the study uh, and the material first produced under the Islamic people that emerged from Arabia in the 7th century. So this could just, this doesn't have to be just devoted to religious art and architecture. Um, it could be secular works of art as well. Um, and so that's really important for you to remember when you hear the term Islamic art. Um, it's not just referring to religious art, um, but all um, sort of art that was produced, um, you know, in this territory and during the expansion of the Islamic faith. All right, now let's look at this map. Um, today, Islamic art describes all the arts that were produced in the lands where Islam was the dominant religion or the religion of those who ruled. Unlike um, the terms Christian, Jewish, and Buddhist art, which refer only to religious art, of these faiths, Islamic art is not used merely to describe religious art or architecture, but applies to all forms produced in the Islamic world. Okay, and so this is the territory and map of um, various um, parts of the world that were un under um, Islamic faith and rule. So they, you know, at one point did have a pretty expansive um, territory. Um, it even went into certain parts of, of Spain. Um, and we'll talk about that um, a little later. Sorry, that's my dog. 
All right, so just to give you a little bit of um, insight into the faith of Islam, um, their belief system is built on the five pillars of Islam. Um, one is this profession of faith, or the shahada. Um, number two, daily prayers. Um, this is referred to as the salat. Um, Muslims are expected to pray five times a day. Um, giving alms, um, zakat, fasting during the Ramadan season, um, and the hajj or pilgrimage that um, they make to Mecca. Um, in my lecture notes, I do have more details about this, so I'm not going to go into great de detail right now, but you should um, take some time um, and read over um, the specifics of the five pillars of Islam. We're going to move on to some of the stylistic conventions. Um, we're going to be looking at religious architecture, in particular the mosque. What you're looking at is an aerial view of the Great Mosque of um, at Karuan Keru in Tusani. I'm sorry, it's the Great Mosque. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have trouble pronouncing some of these names, so forgive me. Um, and so we're going to talk about some of the basic elements of what comprises um, a mosque architecture, just in the same way that we looked at um, basic features of a temple um, and early, you know, early Christian churches. So there is some vocabulary that you are going to have to, to know and memorize and, and, uh, and hopefully be able to use um, if you're asked to write about some of these structures in an essay. Um, almost as soon as the Arab armies of Islam conquered new lands, they began erecting mosques and palaces, as well as commissioning other works of art as expressions of their faith and culture. So this isn't anything new. We've seen other cultures and um, definitely, you know, Christianity um, do this. Connected to this, many aspects of religious practices in Islam also emerged and were codified. The religious practice of Islam which literally means to submit to God, is based on tenets that are known as the five pillars. And we just looked at those. So that's why I do want you to go back and interview those in more detail. Now, you don't have to know this, this particular structure. I'm just using this because it's a, good, it's a good one to talk about the basic architectural features that a lot of mosques have. Again, they vary in style and um, you know, might have some of these features and, and might have additional features. Um, so I just thought this would be good to look at in terms of understanding the architecture of a mosque. From Indonesia to the United Kingdom, the mosque in its many forms is the quintessential Islamic building. Um, just sort of like we think of when we think of the early Christian churches, um, we think of the basilica plan, when we were looking at some of the Byzantine churches, um, you know, that central that central floor plan, um, mosques do have, you know, certain characteristics that they all have in common, even though they might be located in different regions and, you know, obviously built during different time periods. Um, the mosque um, is the Muslim gathering place for prayer, um, and it, and and the word mosque comes from a word called majid, I think that's how you pronounce it, M-A-S-J-I-D, which simply means place of prostration. This will be important when we think about the layout of a mosque. Um, though most of the five daily prayers prescribed in Islam can take place anywhere. So when they pray day, you know, they're, they're expected to pray five, um, five times a day, and they can do this anywhere. They don't have to do it at a mosque. Um, but all men are required to gather together at the mosque for Friday noon prayer. Um, just, just the way with Christians, you know, a lot of Christians are expected to gather at a church for, um, you know, mass on Sunday. So um, it's, it's, you know, a so, sort of similar concept. So when you think about the construction of this space, uh, we have to think about the layout, what the worshipers are doing, how they're entering the space. You might need to think about what sort of rituals they're performing, and that will help us better understand why the space is laid out the way it was or constructed. Um, so again, these aren't just random buildings that they come up with just to house a bunch of people, but you know, they, the architects are really thinking about how the space is used by the worshiper. So we're going to talk about some common features. Um, mosques are designed for communal prayer. Um, 
and um, it's a little bit different. There's not an elaborate ritual um, such that you find like with um, like a, a Christian mass where there's an altar and this sort of ritual happens in the front, and so people have to be positioned to be able to see it and participate. Um, but their space does have there's there's there isn't this visual tension that has to be. Um, called upon um it's a little bit different you know whereas you know with worshipers they have to visually be able to see that altar um and sort of whatever icon or accoutrement religious accoutrement is is, is used in that ritual um the space has to be built to accommodate many worshipers and it has to be able to accommodate them in a prostrate position meaning that you know they they're on their knees and they 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 bow and are prostrate to the ground um, during their prayer. So that is a ritual that they have to, you know, think about um, in the construction and design of a mosque. Whereas Christian architecture often emphasizes verticality, focusing worshipers' um, thoughts towards heaven, Islamic architecture emphasizes horizontally, um, with most of the focus on appropriate living on the earth. The architecture of a mosque is shaped most strongly by the regional traditions of the time and place where it was built. As a result, style, layout, and decoration can vary. Never, nevertheless, m because of the common function of the mosque as a place of congressional prayer, certain architectural features appear in mosques all over the world. So we're going we're gonna to talk about some of those. So I do want you to pay attention um, to this floor plan. Um, again, this... I have a star. I, I need to take that away. You don't have to know this one. It's not on your list of 250 AP works. I will remove that when I post this to your class webpage. But I do like to show this one because it, it's a good, um, it's good at talking about the different elements um, or architectural elements related to a mosque. So the first one is called a Asan, a S A H N. Um, this is this area here. Um, it's it's a hypo style hallway. Um, we've seen this before with Egyptian architecture and Greek architecture, and basically it's a hall or a forest of columns. Okay, remember each of these little circles represents a column. Um, the most fundamental necessity of a congressional mosque architecture is that it be able to hold the entire male population of a city or town. Women were welcome to attend Friday prayers, but not required to do so. To that end, the congressional mosques must have a large prayer hall. Um, in many mosques, this is adjoined to an open courtyard. So this is the area here, number seven. Um, and again, you know, has, you know, there's some similar characteristics to a, a Greek temple where they had an atrium or an open courtyard. Usually there would be a fountain, there'd be plants, you know, planted in this area. Um, and there is a, a cleansing ritual um, that um, worshipers would use. Um, they would go to the fountain and, and perform this cleansing ritual before they would actually enter the hypostyle prayer hall. Um, and again, here's a nave right here, this sort of hallway, um, and we'll, we'll talk more further. Um, but, you know, this is where the worshipers would be. They would sort of be in these little squares right here, sort of in between the columns, and they would lay a mat out um, and, and prostrate themselves um, to Mecca. Um, another important characteristic is the mihrab. Um, this is this little niche right here, number three. Um, or it's, it's, yeah, I'm sorry, it's number two. The dome over it is number three. It's called the Mihira, the Mihira Dome. And in some ways it functions like an altar. Um, you know, the participants don't have to be able to visually see it. They just have to be pointed towards Mecca. And, and that's what the niche, um, or Mihirab does. It's oriented in the direction towards Mecca. Um, some of these niches can be decorative, um, but again, there's not an actual ritual activity taking place. It's really just to orient the worshipers and the temple um, in that direction. The wall that the mihrab is located 
and it's called the Kibla, the Kibla wall. This was um, a question on your quiz. This is the wall that is, you know, in the direction towards Mecca. And so the Kibla wall is the wall that actually has the niche or the mihrab in it. And so all the worshipers would be facing in that direction. Um, another feature um, is a minbar or a pulpit. Um, I don't think it's listed. Um, on this, but it basically it, it's a it, it's kind of like a pulpit. Um, it would often be located on this Kibla wall somewhere. This might be it. It it had like a little pulpit and little stairs. Um, and this was where um, this is where they would um, be called to. Well, this is where um, the prayers would be sort of um, called out and. Um, let me see if I've gotten that right. Yeah, um, this would be, sort of be where the sermon um, would come from and be delivered. Um, again, it's much different. You know, we you know we we, we will see um, some Christian churches that have pulpits and and the priest or um, minister will stand there. But again, you know, usually with a, a Christian church, you know, there's this visibility. Um, here, it's not necessary for the, the worshipers to be able to see, um, you know, just as long as they can hear. Another feature is, um, or a term that you should familiarize yourself with, is called a minaret. Um, so I'm going to point it out over here. A minaret is basically a tower. Um, these are usually adjacent um, to um, the mosque in some way and, and they vary in size and style and some are very elaborate and this is um, the tower um, adjacent or attached to a mosque which um, the call to prayer is announced so there will be this call to prayer and everyone in the surrounding city can hear it um, I've been to a mosque I've been to Morocco and it really is a it's a beautiful sound it's 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 very I don't know, it's just very different. I've never experienced anything like that. Um, so, and then a, a kuba, Q-U-B-B-A, is the dome. And basically this is, um, domes um, are features that um, um, Islamic architects really incorporate into the, the, the structure of a mosque. They do it in different ways. Um, but they viewed the dome in a very similar way to the way, um, you know, Roman, um, the Pantheon, and early Christian um, Byzantine churches um, saw the dome as a sort of heavenly space. Um, so there, there is that similarity. So um, the dome does have this sort of symbolic representation of the vault of heaven. And often the interior decoration of these domes um, are usually decorated with very intricate geometric patterns and, and beautiful foliage motifs. Um, again, you won't see representations of human or animals um, or zoomorphic, Z-O-O-M-O-P-H-R-I-C representations. Um, you do see them in secular work, um, but in, in religious Islamic work, um, representations of the human body and animals were forbidden. So that's why you see, um, instead of um, depictions of people and animals, you see, um, you know, patterns and geographic, um, geometric patterns, and you see a lot of um, text and calligraphy um, used as the decorative program in the interior of these churches. So a little bit different. Part of that is because um, Islam is a literate tradition. Uh, uh, you know, everyone could read. Um, and, and reading was very important and writing, whereas with um, early Christi Christianity, most worshipers were illiterate. And so a lot of the churches had to be decorated and sort of be have a visual narrative um, provided, um, you know, such as the life of Jesus um, to help worshipers understand, um, you know, these, these Christian concepts. So that is something that they, they contrast in. And it's important for you to, to note that. All right, so we are going to look at um, a mosque that is on your list of AP works. Um, this is the mosque at Cordoba, Spain. Um, it was begun in 786. 
Um, when we look at this aerial view, one of the things you have to keep in mind is that some of these structures have been renovated and added on. Um, so there is a Baroque church that's been added to the middle of the structure, um, but that wasn't the original construction of it. Um, the Great Mosque of Cordoba is one of the oldest structures still standing um, from the time Muslims ruled um, Al-Andalus. Um, this was Muslim Iberia, including most of Spain, Portugal, and a small section of southern France in the 8th century. Cordoba is a two-hour train ride from Madrid. The building on the site, um, the buildings on the site are as complex as the extraordinary rich history they illustrate. Historians believe that there had first been a temple to the Roman god Janus on this site. The temple was converted into a church by invading Visigoths, who seized Cordoba in 572. Next, the church was converted into a mosque and then completely rebuilt by the descendant, the descendants of exiled Umayyads. Um, this was the first Islamic dynasty who originally ruled from their capital in Damascus, and this is located in present-day Syria from 661 until 750. Following the overthrow of his family, the Umayyads, in Damascus by the incoming Abbasids, and again, you don't have to know this history, I'm just trying to give you some context, um, Prince Abd al-Raham um, escaped, to the southern, to, escaped to southern Spain. Once there, he established control over most of the Iberian Peninsula and attempted to recreate the grandeur of Damascus in his new capital, Cordoba. And so when you travel to this area of Spain, you do see what um, people refer to as a lot of Moorish architecture, or as, you know, there's a huge influence of Islamic architecture that you see. It's really quite beautiful. Um, this is another view. Um, this is the one um, that you will be I don't know why I don't have these stars on here. Um, so this is one that you do have to know. You need to know this aerial view. Um, he sponsored elaborate building programs, promoted agriculture, um, and even imported fruit trees and other plants from his former home. Um, orange trees still stand in the courtyard of the mosque of Cordoba. Um, and so it really is quite a beautiful mosque. Okay, so, oh, I do have it starred. Okay, so this is the slide that you would have to know for this structure. Um, and as usual, you are expected to be able to identify the floor plan. So again, I, I hope you can look at this. It, you know, again, it has, you know, it varies um, in terms of the first moss that we looked at. But definitely you can see this sort of square, rectangular space. And again, this sort of hypostyle um, courtyard or prayer hall. Um, um, that's a component of this mosque. Um, the building itself was expanded um, over 200 years. It's comprised of a large hypostyle prayer hall. Um, again, hypostyle is a term that we, we first learned in Egyptian art. Um, we saw it utilized in Greek um, temples, and now we're seeing it used here. Um, hypostyle means filled with columns, or you want to think of it as a forest of columns. A courtyard with a fountain in the middle, um, an orange grove, a covered walkway circling the courtyard, and a minaret, a tower used to call the faithful to the prayer um, that is now encased in a square tapered by a bell. Okay, so here I think you can sort of see here's the courtyard and the orange trees, and then this is, you know, it's hard to see the interior, but this is the hypostyle hall. Um, and there's the minaret right over here. That's where they would call um, all the male population of the community to come to prayer. Um, and again, it really helps to sort of look at the aerial view and then just kind of, you know, look at, at the floor plan as well. Um, and, and these are, just to elaborate again, um, the sort of expansion. So this is to clarify that this building, you know, you know, was expanded and, and renovated and added on to over a 200 year period. And so these are actual, this one, two, four, 
one, two, three, four. These are sort of different elements. So this is the first part or part of the structure that was built. And then under um, another regime, the second part was added, this third, and then finally this fourth part. I don't know if you'll have to know that, um, but I just wanted to illustrate that, you know, this, this, this was a structure that um, came to form over many years. Um, so let's look at some of the decorative um, features of, of the mosque. Um, the horseshoe style arch was, a, was common in the architecture of Visigoths, um, um, the people that ruled this area after the Roman Empire collapsed. Remember we talked about, um, you know, when, when the Roman Empire did collapse, they were constantly being invaded by Visigoths and barbarians and, and, um, and we'll see how they influenced um, the art and religion in the western part of what used to be the Roman Empire later. Um, and before the Uma, and so this, this happened before the Umayyads arrived, this ruling dynasty, um, the horseshoe arch eventually spread across North Africa from Morocco to Egypt um, and is an easily identified characteristic of Western Islamic architecture. So when we think of Greek, when we think of Roman art and Etruscan to a certain point, we think of this utilization of the arch. Well, Islamic art really incorporated the arch as well, but they put a different spin on it. So this is referred to as a horseshoe arch, or in some, and some people describe it as a keyhole. Um, arch because it almost looks like a, like a little keyhole that a skeleton key would fit into. And so this is a, a very important characteristic of, um, of Islamic um, architecture. So however, the area where the horseshoe arch developed their characteristics from on um, Islamic buildings was in Spain and North Africa, um, where they may be seen on the Great Mosque of Cordoba, which we're looking at now. Um, the Mosque of Cordoba was originally the site of a Christian church built in the early 600s, but the present mosque was begun in 784. So here you really do start to see what I was talking about describing earlier. Um, we're, we're looking at exterior decorative um, decoration, but definitely you see lots of patterning, um, geometric motifs, um, very, very ornamental. Um, very, very breathtaking, I think. So we're going to travel to the interior of the church, and this is and this is an important slide for you to know. Um, the expansive prayer hall. So we're we're actually inside the prayer hall. This is that hypo style courtyard um, that we've been talking about. Um, is magnified by its repeated geometry. Um, it is built with recycled ancient Roman columns, spoilia, remember that term, from which um, sprout a striking combination of two-tiered symmetrical arches formed of stone um, and red brick. So this is what they're referring to here. Um, there are 514 columns that were harvested from existing Roman and Visigothic buildings, um, but since they were only about nine feet tall, they were too short to keep the building from being extremely dark and claustrophobic. As a result, they invented um, the two-tiered arch, arch system that you see here to raise the ceiling and increase interior light. Um, again, the red in the striped arch is red brick, while the white is white marble. Um, the second tier is about three feet above the first. These striped arches are seen in some medieval Christian churches as well. So we will see this um, carry over um, into some of the early Christian churches. Um, but see, see the columns here. So they're so short, and so to, and, you know, so to to counteract that, they develop not just one arch, but this two arch system. And it really does have this sort of repetition and and rhythm to it um, that you know I think enhances the structure and, and goes along with, you know, a lot of the decorative features and program, interior decoration of, of the mosque. So we talked about the focal point. The focal point in the prayer hall um, is the famous horseshoe arch 
a horseshoe arch, um, mihrab, this is that sort of niche, um, or the prayer niche in the Qibla wall. Again, a mihrab is used in a mosque to identify the wall that faces Mecca. Um, and so this is, um, this is an example. So again, these little niches were, were very decorative or could be decorated. And here, I don't, that's my dog scratching. Here you can um, see the use of text or calligraphy um, that they're using um, as decoration. And again, that's sort of vegetative and motifs of plant and foliage. Um, so the mihrab in the Great Mosque of Cordoba is framed by exquisitely decorated arch behind which um, an unusually large space the size of a small room um, is located. Gold tesserae or small pieces of glass with gold and color backing. And this is something that we saw with um, early Christian churches. You know, they used um, glass mosaics or tesserae, um, creating a dazzling combination of dark blue, reddish browns, yellows, and golds. And again, the, they incorporate this intri intricate um, callig calligraphy. Um, and bands of um, vegetative motifs that adorn the arch. So again, no depictions of animals or humans, but definitely the use of calligraphy and text and, and sort of these different um, decorative motifs of flowers and plants. Um, it's, it's really quite exquisite. And it, it does. I, I do, you know, I do think you see, you know, this idea of Byzantine with the use of mosaics and tesserae for the decoration, but the subject matter is different where within a Byzantine church they would actually depict um, the figure of Jesus Christ or, you know, the patron of, of the church or whoever the ruler was. Um, here, um, it's, it's more decorative. I'm sorry, that's my dog Chloe in the background. She's being kind of noisy. Okay, so um, this is the Mihirab Dome. So this is the dome that's sort of over... Um, and stuff over the Qibla wall and then you have this sort of this niche or the mihrab and again note the horseshoe arch um, and it's it's really quite beautiful and very intricate um, above the mihrab is an equally dazzling dome um, it's built of crisscrossing ribs so this is this is what they're referring to this is a sort of system again that sort of helps in the construction and, and support of the dome um, and these create pointed arches, and they're lavishly covered with gold mosaic and a radial pattern. Um, this astonishing building technique anticipates later Gothic rib vaulting, which is something that we'll talk about later, um, but they do this on a, um, the way the, the French do it, um, it's on a more modest scale. Sorry, my dogs are, are fighting again. Hold on. Okay, so this will be something to think about. Um, when we move further into Christian art, which we will get back to after we talk about Islamic art, um, uh, something that emerges is something called a pointed arch um, that becomes really crucial in, in sort of the development of these beautiful Gothic churches that you, you see um, around Paris and in France, and they're, they're quite um, breathtaking. Um, and so they have, you know, these sort of similar characteristics. All right, so here's a diagram, again, that sort of talks about the evolution of the arch. Here you have sort of the simple semi-circle arch, um, the horseshoe arch, that looks like a keyhole, um, the pointed arch, which will um, really be introduced, it was introduced in, oops, it was introduced in Islamic architecture, um, but becomes a really important architectural feature and characteristic in, in Gothic Christian churches um, when, we, when we talk about that period. And then a keel arch um, that has flat sides and slopes where other arches are curved. Um, and this is something that uh, that is used in Islamic architecture as well. So it is important that you, when you talk about arches and in relation to specific structures and um, 
different periods and cultures that you, you do be specific, you know, you can't just say arch, you know, if you're talking about Islamic architecture, you really do want to use the term horseshoe arch, and, you know, when we get into Gothic, the pointed arch, so, again, that's something I'm noticing in your essays, that sometimes y'all, y'all aren't as detailed, and um, you, you really do need to be more specific in, in using your vocabulary um, and terms, um, because there's a lot of them, and so when you say arch, I mean, that, that could mean anything. <laughs> so, um, you know, do take the time to understand the nuances between these different arches. All right. So I'm going to stop here. Um, we are going to talk about the Alhambra Spain in my next lecture. Um, so I'll see you then. Bye.